shifting a bit, but tying it to our economy. You know, you you're on recess right now. There's no. a lot of talk about uh, the budget, right. and what's going to happen with the budget, uh, President. The president. <laughs> it's very hard for me to still say yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I almost said President Obama. President Trump uh, has put forth a budget that increases military spending astronomically by $58 right. billion. It's yeah. mind blowing. In the meantime, everything domestically has been cut that does not that is not, you know, uh, border patrol or, you know, police force or whatever sort of um, subsidies that would aid his his, you know, privatization of the country. You, when you when you look at that budget as a congressman and you don't have the majority in Congress right now, what tactics are you planning to highlight that what's going on in Syria and North Korea and Afghanistan and, and all these military exploits that mm -hmm. President Trump has done in the past you know couple of weeks directly affect the the the, the, the cost of bread the you know people's access to health care, um, education, all the things that people are concerned right. about and they're turning out for in their town halls. Yeah. Well, I, and it's a great point because this often comes up in the town halls. I mean, you're cutting uh, meals on wheels. Mm -hmm. You're cutting uh, national endowment for the humanities. You're cutting weatherization programs. And here you have this $54 billion uh, increase mm -hmm. on defense. And I'm on the Armed Services Committee, so oh, wow. uh, I certainly won't be supporting uh, that kind of increase. It's uh, uh, unnecessary, but what can we do? Well, one of the things Tim Ryan and I have done actually is written to the Department of Defense uh, to go after some of the waste and the fraud and abuse. And let me give you concrete examples. I mean, there are practices where uh, companies don't have to disclose their costs if they classify the products that they're selling the Department of Defense as commercial as opposed to uh, in the national security. So there are uh, cases of people jacking up these prices, 500%, 1,000%. Uh, Matt Stoller has written about the monopolies, and uh, the monopolies are not just in the telecom industry or the airline industry, but a lot of the defense contractors and monopolistic practices that are hurting taxpayers. So before the president comes and asks for $54 billion, how about uh, figuring out if the taxpayers are actually uh, being overcharged and uh, having a transparent process. And I can raise that, I have raised that, Tim Ryan has raised that because he's on defense appropriations. Uh, and we need uh, to really uh, hold defense accountable. You know, Harry Truman did this in the 1940s. I mean, they saved $10 billion, a lot of money during World War II. It was bipartisan. Uh, and they went after people who were trying to profit from the war. So. Uh, this is an area where I think Democrats really need to be bold. Uh, we need to oppose the uh, spending, not just cave in. Uh, and we need to, to go after the abuse uh, to taxpayers. What do you think has stopped Democrats from doing that in the past? They don't, want to be, they don't want to be seen as soft on defense, right? And uh, you know, one of the cases I came out with Syria just categorically opposed to those strikes for strategic reasons, mm -hmm. not to speak about, well, they should have come to the Congress for an up or down vote. Mm -hmm. Of course they should have come for the Cong to the Congress for an up or down vote. But beyond the constitutional question, what do you think substantively? Uh, my view is we ought to actually be uh, quoting some of our founders or John Quincy Adams, who was uh, the Secretary of uh, uh, State uh, under Monroe. He has this famous passage where he says, well, America shouldn't go out to seek monsters uh, to destroy. Uh, and really what we ought to do is uh, lend our voice uh, and our credibility to human rights, but not militarily uh, go and intervene. Because he says we can't ever figure out who the good guys are. I mean, it's much more eloquently written. But here was his vision, which he's, he understood that if we did that, if we went in and intervened militarily, we'd actually be seen not as a liberator, but as uh, possibly uh, using dictatorial force. And he warned about this. So we've got to say, look, we're not soft on defense. We're not weak by saying that we ought not to be intervening. Look at what we did. We intervened in Iraq. Uh, that created the uh, situation in part in ISIS because of uh, in Syria. Uh, we've in intervened in Afghanistan. Well, 40% of Afghanistan is still under Taliban control. Uh, how have we improved uh, that situation? So we're, we're not picking off on uh, the, the, the right side. Uh, what we ought to be doing is saying, look, Assad has committed uh, atrocities. There's no question, forgetting just the chem chemical weapons. I mean, four million Sunnis have been displaced. Uh, it's been systematic displacement. His father in the 1982 uh, massacre uh, you know, killed a lot of folks. I mean, these aren't good folks, but let's call for an international tribunal. Let's call for uh, human rights prosecution. Let's, uh, as 
Quincy Adams would say, lend our voices to the moral cause, but not intervene militarily, which makes matters worse. I think we can be strong, principled, uh, without being militaristic. And, and frankly, I think that m I wish more Democrats would speak to the substance of a progressive foreign policy uh, instead of being, uh, there's this fear that, oh, we'll be uh, projected as weak on national security. Do you think some of that's reactive to ways of, of the past, strategies of the past, you know, the Dukakis moment, which is now almost 30 years yeah. ago? Uh, I believe the culture shifted a lot. And, you know, this generation that's rising up grew up with two wars, right. felt it firsthand, unlike the previous generation, which, you know, of course, there was, uh, there, there was the Gulf War, but it didn't have the same implications that, you know, this generation has, has felt uh, when it comes to war. I don't know many millennials, and, and you have a lot of millennials in your district, and you're, you're young. Right. I think you're a millennial yourself. Uh, you? I'm 40, Millennial so. Okay, you're, you're in the range. <laughs> Who, I, I don't see them saying, when they go to the voting booth, I want a strong Democrat who's bold uh, when it comes to national security. Right. What do you think it's going to take for the Democrats in the House and the leadership and, and those who are setting the strategy to recognize that that form of Democrat does not exist anymore. It is not seeked. Well, I think that the, 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 your views of the Melodies should ask Democrats to speak first more clearly, not let them get away with just saying, okay, we're going to duck the substance, but we're for President uh, Trump or should have come to Congress to seek authorization, right? Mm -hmm. That's an easy thing to say. I think we, we need to say we need a, a smarter, mm -hmm. progressive vision of a foreign policy. And, uh, and that this is a core component. You look to your point, I mean, Howard Dean ran against the Iraq war. Uh, he did very, very well. Then you had Obama really running against the Iraq war against Hillary Clinton. And then you had Bernie Sanders, I think, running on, uh, we shouldn't have been in Libya, we mm -hmm. shouldn't have uh, be intervening in Syria, we should be getting out of Afghanistan. So you've had, for, in my judgment, uh, the past 13, 14 years, really this sense of a politics, understanding we don't want to be intervening overseas right. with military might. And I don't think the leadership uh, has gotten that yet. I mean, because there's such a, a fear of being, uh, maybe it's this Dukakis moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think most Americans, and by the way, I don't think this is just a liberal issue. I think there are people like Rand Paul on the right, who I disagree with a lot of things, but who uh, also understands that uh, there is a cost to intervention. There's a cost to just expansion of NATO mm -hmm. uh, and pro provocation. And so uh, I think this is a nation that is weary uh, of uh, our interventions and understands that it hasn't made America more secure or the world more secure. Do you think that most congressmen and women understand the dynamics of what's happening in Syria? Well, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that they, 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 they think they do, but I, uh, you know, I don't want to be critical. I just got there, but I, but, but, but I, but, oh, the, but, the, but, the, but the question is, do they, do they understand uh, all the connections? Do they understand that it was our disbanding of the Saddam uh, Baptist regime that led to ISIS, that it was in part our call for regime change in uh, the late 2000, 2011, that uh, made Syria even more of an attractive magnet for mm -hmm. rebel groups, uh, that the chemical weapons, as despicable as they were, struck Al-Qaeda, so it's not clear uh, who the good people guys even are in the region, uh, and, and that there's been, uh, on the Assad regime, really four million uh, displacement of Sunnis. I mean, this has been a systemic uh, policy that's, that's horrific, but, uh, but, but the, the response to it uh, militarily, just having 59 missiles with an American label. I mean, here's what I don't get with our, our policymakers. I mean, do they stop to think about the story the Syrians are going to tell their kids? Right. They're not going to say America intervened because uh, they wanted to put an end to uh, chemical weapons, even if that may be the case. They're going to say there were 59 missiles that landed in your country with, with an American label. And we continue to, to, to not think about how the world tells the story about us. And, and it's surprising because politicians are so aware of their narrative usually about how they're perceived by others. Well, we need to be sensitive to uh, what we're doing to perpetuate uh, other generation of, of hate uh, and, and that, that how that's not in the United States strategic interest. Some say that the strategy for Donald Trump was that it, it wasn't actually to make a big impact. It was more of the headline, more of the uh, to appear strong. You know, he's not he's not one to walk softly and carry a big stick. Those missiles that went to the um, 
the airport, the uh, road, the runway. You know, it was, it was highly ineffective. Right. I mean, they were bombing the next day. Right. They were they were bombing the next day, uh, and same would be said about Afghanistan when he hit a region that he says was a bunch of caves, but of course it was the most populated uh, province in all of Afghanistan. So you think about the narrative that he puts out there, and then the facts. But you don't. I don't hear Democrats giving that side, saying, you know, this is what actually happened. And we have to call him out. And to, to, to what did we change on the ground in Afghanistan? Right. We know the facts that forty percent of Afghanistan right now is support, is under the control of the Taliban. We only the government only controls sixty percent. We know the Taliban is actually making deals with Russia, with Pakistan, and China. And uh, to put it in context, and, and maybe I know part of the, the history there, just being South Asian, and even though I was born, born here, you know, on the Kashmir border, where you have uh, 3,000 uh, alleged terrorists in, uh, in, in Kashmir, uh, the Indian government uh, has about 100,000 troops there. Now, whatever else you think about uh, the, the conflict, and there are many sides to it, that's a 30 uh, to 1 ratio. Now, if we have 10,000 troops in Afghanistan. If we really were thinking of bringing stability to that region, we would need 300,000 troops, and no one in this country would support it. So then the question is, what are we doing there? Mm -hmm. And why are we debating incremental troop increases from 10,000 to 15,000 or bombing things when 40% of the, uh, the country isn't even in our control? And what is the justification? I was opposed to the escalation that uh, under Obama, I spoke out against that. I'm uh, opposed to the continuation uh, under Trump, I mean, someone. We just need to f figure out uh, a, a way of exiting with honor, uh, maybe supporting uh, the current government and letting it play play out, and and speaking for human rights without uh, losing more lives and costing our security. It's been the, one of the longest wars in American mm -hmm. history, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this is where I think the Democrats need to to talk about it. We we, we ought to have our vision of foreign policy, right? Not just saying. Well, Trump's violating the Constitution. Trump didn't come to Congress. Trump need, because that's that's not what people want to hear. People want to hear what is your vision of foreign policy? Uh, how are you going to make the country safer? How are you going to extricate uh, out of these wars and out of this mess? And I think if we led with that and we led with the detailed knowledge of these areas and had a progressive foreign policy, then we give people a choice. And by the way, if people don't like that choice, fine. But at least let's put out a substantive choice. If we're going to argue. Uh, on, the, on the semantics, people will default to Trump because they won't see that there's a substantive alternative vision. Hmm. There was a platform committee meeting, um, set of meetings to write the platform of the Democratic Party last year, right. uh, uh, leading up to the convention. Uh, right before the convention, the, the committee met, and you know there were sides. There was the Bernie side and the Hillary side, uh, and some DNC members, and you know they wrote the platform together. It's almost like we need to have another platform committee right. <laughs> after this experience. You know, what is the Democratic Party in a post-Trump world? Yes. Because I think back at those moments and and seeing, uh, I believe it's General Allen on stage advocating for, advocating for USA USA and, and almost like it was an intervention uh, perspective, an interventionist perspective right. on stage. And a lot of people were put off by that at the convention. So uh, whatever that message was in in. The f in July of 2016 seems to be a very different message than what Democrats want in a post-Trump world. I think that's right. I think we need to have, I think what was very helpful about the Democrats coming together on uh, on, on some of the economic things is led to some concrete success, right? I'm on the College for All bill that Senator Sanders introduced. Mm -hmm. Well, that was based on the work uh, the DNC platform committee did. Uh, imagine that, a politician actually taking uh, Senator Sanders taking things that the platform committee did and actually introducing it. And it's one of the things I uh, admire about Senator Sanders is, uh, you know, obviously I supported him, but regardless of that, uh, whoever you supported, he's actually trying to offer a positive vision, right? It's not just he's going to have a, a carbon tax and a climate change bill. So, uh, but the point you raise is a good one. We need a foreign policy progressive unified vision uh, that uh, talks about uh, in my judgment, the harm, the first policy should be do no harm in these areas. Mm -hmm. And talks about our overthrow of Mosaday in, uh, in 1953, and talks about the role we played in the Congo, and talks about how often we've made uh, matters worse, and maybe harkens back to John Quincy Adams because we have actually a uh, basis of America's founding, uh, some of our founding early statesmen uh, for a view of uh, a non-militaristic intervention, that they actually viewed that as part of 
America's uniqueness as not being a colonial uh, empire like the British, being a democratic republic. So I, I think we need it on that, and I think we need it on issues of, uh, of race and, and, and justice as well, uh, uh, you know, uh, on, on, on police brutality. And, and Chris Hayes has this great book out on col a colony within a nation, talking about this disparate uh, legal systems that we, uh, we live in, and what are we doing to really address those issues of, uh, 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 of racial justice and, and uh, incarceration rates, and uh, having a strong platform on that, having a strong platform on uh, appreciating uh, the vulnerable populations and, uh, of, of immigrants and what it means to, you know, rhetoric of being seen as the other, which is, mm -hmm. you know, Trump's narrow vision of America. It's not that we don't want a common American identity, but it's, it's got to be an inclusive American identity. So I think it's a great idea. And I, I, I think we're moving, if, if, if the 2016 showed anything, it seems to me and in these town halls, it's, I think we're moving away from a politics of personality mm -hmm. uh, and to a politics of substance. I mean, people are really looking at who's co-sponsoring bills, and, oh, yeah. uh, and it's, no, it's no longer enough to just give a fancy speech on uh, the floor uh, and appeal to a motion and say, uh, I know these people in my district who lost their health care, and this is why I'm uh, for universal health care. People want to know, are you on John Conyers' bill of Medicare mm -hmm. for all, right? I mean, I don't care about all your speeches. Where, where do you stand? Uh, and I think the Democratic Party is at a place, and the progressive community that they they want to know the details mm -hmm. and they want to know what what is the substance and that's not a bad thing that's actually what the conservatives did they had a a, a very um, clear sense of where people stood